Good evening, good evening, good evening, everyone. Welcome to RJH's live stream on the 1st of June, 2021. And welcome to everybody. What a lovely day it has been. Um, so we'll see how we go tonight. Anyway, back by popular demand is module two. So back by popular demand is module two. So RGH live stream on Tuesday, the 1st of June, 2021, just off of the bank holiday Monday, uh, bank holiday weekend, uh, module two training back by popular demand. Now I say popular demand, I have messages from people up and down the country, I've got mod twos coming up, I've got mod twos coming up, I've got mod twos coming up. So I thought, right, fantastic. Going to get a live stream on again about module two. The last one was very, very successful. Play back on it. It's on the playlist. Um, so it is all about module two. So first of all, then, welcome, everybody. And what I want to do, I suppose, really, is thank the RJH team again. Um, because anybody that's on the channel and follow us weekly basis, last week I was congratulating everybody and praising everybody for all their hard work in absolutely appalling conditions because the weather seemed to be raining for a whole month and it was wet, it was windy, it was uh, cold for May and we're thinking, crikey, what's going on, what's going on, what's going on? And then overnight bank holiday weekend which isn't normally the weather has just gone absolutely the other way and it is that hot that hot it's uncomfortably hot to be riding teaching so thank goodness um that the team have got all their summer gear out and everything so well done team r a r j h for last week and the last month for the cold weather but well done for this last week because it has been really really warm which is fantastic news it is fantastic news so a big congratulations to them um lots of test passes at r j h uh, today, we've had tests in Shrewsbury, we've had tests in um, Atherton, we've had tests in Blackburn, Darwin. So a big well done to those successful passes. And it really is nice to see. And also for those that have been messaging me from up and down the country that have also been passing in the last week, um on the back of our videos that have been helping them so that is good news and um just gives us more motivation to keep making more videos and continue with the live streams because the live streams are proving very popular so i hope the quality is good i hope the quality is a better um just invested as we know on a little bit of a better setup so all being well now i have got the windows open in the office so you may see a little bit of back drop um, movement from the windows I've got a couple of windows in here you may hear a little bit of noise although we do tend to be quiet as our neighbours are very quiet and for those of you that know those of you that know they know um so yeah it's it's inspiring and it's humbling that getting all these messages from people up and down the country but i just wanted to go really nice um congratulations because i went in i actually had today off but managed to get a late test for somebody and it's a, a lad that's come over to us from Stockton on Tees, Dave. And he's passed his module one. I did half a day today with him. He's passed his module one today. And he's come all the way over from Stockton on Tees. And one of the reasons that he's come over to us is our YouTube channel. So, Dave, you might be watching us from your hotel room. Good man. Well done. Very pleased for you. Um, so... Tonight's live stream, all about module two. 
So those of you that have got a module two coming up, get asking me questions. Get answer, asking those questions on here because this is going to be a good live stream. You may not be at that stage. You may be at the CBT stage or your theory or your module one, but this is a good video, a good live stream that you can answer any questions you want about module two. Module two, practical test, the road test. That is going to be the topic of tonight's live stream. So, fluids at the ready. Notes at the ready. The official riding test report at the ready. So who is with us this evening so far? Uh, good evening, Lisa. Good evening, Darren. Uh, good evening, Ballbag, the I-20. Frank Cook, good evening from Sonny Letchworth. Ronald Bear, good evening. Richard Sankey, good evening. Dean Parker, good evening. Paul Suggan, good evening. Yes, there's a few newer names there. Um, which bike has the better stopping distance, a 125 or a 650? Well, there's no right or wrong answer. It's how fast you're going. It's the weather and road conditions. It's how quickly you react. The biggest contributor to your, your shorter stopping distance ball bag is your reaction time. The quicker you react, the quicker you will stop. Um, but, you know, the emergency stopping on your test, remember, we have said is stopping in the shortest distance you can, given the road and traffic conditions, the weather conditions, safely. You need to be doing it safely. OK, Um so, yeah, also, just to let everybody know, also, we are continuing with our, our uh, traditional competition. If we get 100 people watching this live stream at the same time, we're going to be firing you in a question and somebody can win on the quickest answer, the correct answer. Somebody can win a free CBT worth £199. And that CBT can be taken at our Northwich, our Wigan and our uh, Manchester training schools same condition same everything which would stop quickest well uh as the 125 got abs as the 650 got abs one would think the lighter bike would stop quicker the heaviest bike would take longer to stop so what's the weight of the bikes Twin disc 650, yeah, these are all things that, you know, need to be considered. I suppose it would come down to the rider, wouldn't it? It would come down to the rider. So, yeah, um, tonight's live stream is module two. Module two. And that is what we are going to be having a discussion on. And we've had a few Module 2 passes today. Indeed, we had one lad. He passed his test with us, and he came down to show his bike off within a few hours of, um, of, uh, of passing his test. And fantastic to see these happy faces. Um, so if you're, getting, if you're going for your Module 2, I suppose one thing I should say is a big congratulations because it means that you've completed your CBT. It means that you've passed your theory test and it means that you've passed your module one test. And um, on, on sort of looking at uh, 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 trainees that we present to tests, um, the mentally um, demanding test is the module one because people do get themselves in a bit of a um, pickle and the nerves kick in and stuff like that. So once they've got that module one pass certificate, 
um, then the colour comes back into their cheeks and they relax a little bit more because the roads are a little bit more familiar for them. So um, I suppose, yeah, if you're looking now at your Module 2 test, then a big congratulations for getting to the last part. If you think part four, um, it would be um, the final part in you obtaining your full motorcycle license, whether that is an A1, an A2, or an A direct access. Because if you're doing an A1, if you're doing an A2, if you're doing direct access, the format, the route, one, two, three, four, the four stages are all the same. So yes, tonight's live stream is all about module two. So module two training, module two test really, isn't it? We're talking about the module two test. Getting a bit of a bit of a discussion on the breaking distance on uh, breaking distances on a between a six fifty cc and a one two five cc. I'll leave you. To, I'll leave you boys to it. I'm not going to get too involved in that because I want to try and focus on module two. Um, so that's a module two um, ride and test report. Well, they don't give you one of those now at the moment, whether it'll come back in. They use the um, iPads and they just do, uh, you get your reports emailed to you. But this is a riding test report, um, which will do module one and module two. Uh, module one in the main is up to number 12. And then the rest... So module two, but a riding test report. So let's talk about the module two test. And anybody got any questions about it, you just get commenting away and we'll see how we go. So currently 12 minutes in and we have 16 people watching. So 11 likes, 16 people watching. So can we all make sure that we do please like the video, uh, share the video, and, um, you know, set your reminder on for the next few live streams because we've got some exciting stuff planned ahead. And they are on the playlist in date order when they're coming up. So do like the videos, share the videos, and please do set your reminder so that you get notified on the next video or i say video but the next live stream and now the weather's getting a bit uh, warmer now i am going to be looking at my top 10 tips to um completing the perfect u-turn that's one of my videos that i'm planning at the moment um, so then, um, module two, what documentation we need to take on our, to, when we arrive for our module two test, we need to take, um, our driver's license. Um, now that is potentially still uh, the old one. So your driver's license, photo card license. And if it's the old style license, you would need to take a photo ID like a passport, okay? So first thing, make sure that you're taking the documentation correctly, um, your license, um, your CBT certificate, and you need to take your motorcycle theory test certificate. So you do need that documentation or you're gonna struggle with your test, okay? So plan ahead. Get it all ready the night before, get it in a folder. And when you get to the test uh, training center, let your instructor take it. So all of our instructors take all of the documents 
and keep them in their top box. So one less thing for you to worry about, okay? So documentation is essential. Um, also, you need to make sure you are wearing all of the correct equipment. Um, and we provide at RJH helmet, jacket, gloves, trousers. We do not provide footwear. So ankle protection footwear is essential. OK, so anything that's not covering the ankles, you will struggle on your test. All right. So ankle protection footwear is a must. Um, body armor jacket, um, helmet and gloves. So the examiners, like the module one, they do look at what you're wearing. So make sure you've got the right clothing. And if you're in doubt, get your instructors at your training school to advise you. So you've got all the right documentation and you're wearing all the right gear. And one thing you do need at the moment is a face mask or a neck tube to cover up your face whilst you meet the examiner. And what he'll do is ask you to, so when he checks the license, ask you to move it down and put it back up. Now, we use eight different test centres at the moment, and all of them require you to have a face mask or um, a neck tube. Now, we have RJH neck tubes, as most of you um, that have been watching have seen them. So we provide all of our test candidates with a neck tube free of charge, although anybody that comes, trains with a CBT or anything can buy them. Um, and um, you may need a pen and you may need an earpiece. And at the moment, some of the test centres we find are a little bit more relaxed. They are providing the earpieces now, and we don't need a pen. Other test centres are still very much earpiece and a pen. So again, check with your instructor. They should know um, all of that. Um, so you arrive, you've got your documentation checked, you've got your uh, you've checked what you're wearing, you've signed the declaration, and um, everything is looking good. Always arrive on time. On test day, always arrive on time. Please do not be late. It puts pressure on the instructors. And ensure you have your documentation. Do not forget your documentation. It puts unnecessary stress on your instructors. Not just us, but any, anybody that's watching across the country. Be prepared. Be prepared. Um, so you've had your documentation check. You've had your what you're wearing check. Everything's unky-dory. The next thing he is going to do is ask you to lead the way outside. Bit of a chit-chat. He's going to kick you out with his radio, explain what he wants you to do, which is follow the road straight ahead, follow the road signs, um, you know, follow the road straight ahead unless traffic signs tell you otherwise. he tell you how long the test is going to last. he like tell you he's going to get you to pull over a few times. Um, but he'll just tell you to relax and just get on with it. He wants you just to get on with it. So don't do anything differently with him than what you've done with your lessons. Just imagine you're out on your own. And best way to think about him is a sat-nav. Think of him as a sat-nav. And, you know, forget he's even there. Get going. Make your own decisions. Get going. Um, so, yeah. That's um, that. Just looking at a few more messages before I carry on. So, what have we got? Darren S. Bob. Dave Smith caught me out with this one. Just got in. Evening, Governor. Good evening, Dave. This one has come back by popular demand, and it is all about module two. Anybody that is looking at module two tests coming up, stick about on this video. 
you can pick up a lot of useful information, a lot of top tips, ask any questions that you want. And I am here for the next hour or two. See how it goes. Um, good evening, Ellen. Hi, Rob. One tip would be to write down your email address. Never got my results as you put it in wrong. Yes, some email addresses and they are sort of typing it in, aren't they, Ellen? And it is, you know, that first few minutes is a little bit twitchy. You know, you've not met him before and stuff, though. Yes, Ellen. If you write down your email address on a piece of paper correctly, because some email addresses are quite challenging to write down. So write your email address down and give it to him, and then he can just copy it into his iPad, can't he? Ellen, that is a really good tip. And what I might do is tell all of our guys to do that, because I like the sound of that, Ellen. Well done. And welcome to the live stream as well. What if you're medically exempt and have an exemption card for Facebook? That's not a problem, Dave. If you, if that is the case, you do not need to wear one. So, yep, they're not there to make things difficult. Darren S., I used to have an RGH neck tube. A friend nicked it after our run to Belgium and up across at the weekend. Darren, um, Email me your address, mate, and I'll pop one in the post to you. How does that sound? Because you, uh, you've you um, won two of our competitions and you've donated them to somebody else. So pop your address, Darren, in an email and I will send you one. And I will send that to you, Darren, free of charge because you've you've donated a couple of your competition prizes elsewhere. Um, wish my instructor would have told me when to break and where to stop. I've had to find out for myself. On is that on the module one ball bag? If it is, we've got lots of videos on here, mate. Uh, Darren S, how long does a road glide last? Ooh, 35 minutes, 35 minutes tops. It can be shorter than that because you might you might get round the round the route a bit quicker. So put your foot down. Or not put your foot down, you know, get yourself up to speeds a bit and you'll you'll get around a bit quicker. Um ball bag, hope it's not a dodgy as mod one. <laughs> hope it's not a dodgy as mod one is the challenging one. Mod two, relax, enjoy it, get on with it. Um Darren, you're a star, Rob. You're welcome, mate. What's your nearest bike school to Bradford? We get a lot of pupils from Bradford. In fact, we have had a few pupils from Bradford. And let me tell you now, they are not disappointed when they come to us because we've got a school in Wigan and we've got a school in Manchester. So, ball bag, get down to us. We will look after you. So um, you've met the examiner then, and he's gone outside, giving you a bit of a brief of what he wants you to do. And um, the first thing that he's going to do, before he even gets to your bike, the first thing that he's going to do is make sure you can read a number plate from 20.5 metres. So you need to read a number plate from 20.45, 20 20.4, did I say 20.4? From 20.5 metres, you need to read a number plate. Um, and then once you've done that, he'll, he'll go over to, uh, he'll ask you where your bike is. Um, now, certain test centres are allowing more than one bike in. Other test centres at the moment, um, that we, as I said, we use eight of them. Um, another one of the test centres that we use, you're only allowed one bike in there and you're only allowed to take your bike in there 10 minutes before your test. But anyway, you need to take him, um, take him to your bike. He'll make a, a note of your registration number and he will then um, walk around your bike generally, walk around it, um, he's making sure there's an L plate displayed on the front and an L, L plate displayed on the back. And he's just having a visual check to make sure 
in his opinion that the bike is suitable for the test. So as an example, if he sees a screw or a nail in the tire, um, then he wouldn't wouldn't continue. Um, you know, if the bike was in poor order, then he wouldn't wouldn't continue. So and we we sort of we do run a bike fleet. We've now got just shy of 40 bikes and all of those bikes are under five years old and they are all well maintained tip top condition and to be honest with you um we do clean them regularly we've now got a bike uh, valitor that comes around once a week to keep them in a tip top condition wherever we possibly can um so that's that um what he would then do is ask you uh, two questions on the bike and it's a show me tell me questions and so what i'm going to do is put some links down below when i've finished um and you will find down below um some links to videos that i've done and the show me tell me's show me tell me because you get two of those and i will also um put a link down to the other question because you get one question on carrying a pillion passenger so let me put in there uh, pillion passenger so the first thing that you're going to get done when you um, get to test center, when your test has started, your test starts as soon as you've met him. As soon as you've done the declaration and signed it, um, you know, you're on your test. So go out, your eyesight check is, is part of your test. Um, and so show me, tell me is where you get two questions. And your pillion passengers where you get one question. They are all... Um, this is now your test is started. Now, if you don't answer those correctly, you get a minor fault. Now, minor fault. On your module two test, you can accumulate 10 minor faults and pass your test 10. 11 minor faults is a fail. One serious fault or one dangerous fault is a fail. So you don't want them. Now, we get people passing. Um, and I can't say it hasn't happened because it has. We do get some people that have passed that have got seven or eight faults. Um, and, you know, the pupil, it's nothing to be proud of. That's quite a messy ride. But, you know, put it down. A pass is a pass. But if you get in seven or eight, nine faults, then there's some more development needed. But there's development needed if you pass with no faults. Everybody is always developing their riding. But you're playing close to the wind, aren't you? If, you, if you're getting up in there. So most people that we come back with, with your module two passes are under five faults. They're generally under five faults. And, you know, if you can get under five faults, that's a good ride. Uh, if you get no faults, that's an even better ride. But uh, faults, 10 minor faults is a pass. 11 minor faults is a fail. One serious and one dangerous is a fail. Don't want any of those. So just saw that come through, Aaron on the other com uh, Darren on the other computer, mate. So um, I'll pick one up tomorrow. Pop one in the post to you, fella. All right. Um, so we're happy with that. Show me, tell me, pillion passage. Now at that point, um, the examiner will go and either. Uh, get on his bike or he will get in his car <laughs> now people say to me oh because it's so hot now they get in their car because they've got air conditioning or if it's raining they get in their car because they don't want to get wet or they say 
you know, that's that's it, the car bike, but it doesn't work like that, okay? And there is a very genuine reason why an examiner will either be in a car or on a bike, and I'm going to explain why. And I'm also going to explain about this. People say they can only pass. When I say they, I'm talking about the DVSA, the Driver and Vehicle Standards Agency, the Driver and Vehicle Standards Agency, who conduct the tests. A little bit of fluid. Um, so, first of all, the reason that they are either in a car or on a bike is as follows. If you want to become a bike examiner, which I wouldn't want to, if you want to become a bike examiner, you would have to be a car examiner first. So you would have to be a car examiner before you become a bike examiner. And that's just the qualification process. Now, whether that changes in the future, who knows? But that is as it is now. So if, say, there's a month or two where the bikes go quiet, then that in examiner can be put into the cars. So it sort of makes um, it more productive for an instructor to be able to do bikes and cars. Yeah, so we've got that. And if, a, if an examiner is in a car doing your test, that simply means that he has a mixture of tests on that day. So he's got a mixture of bike tests and he's got a mixture of car tests. So why is he in the car, you might ask? So the reason is, what if it's raining then? So if it's raining and he was following you on a bike and he got then soaking wet and then his next test was a car he'd have to go and sit in the car all wet or smelly and wet so if he's in the car all, all day doing bikes and then he in the car doing car tests then he's not going to get that and that really is the only reason okay it's all to do with his schedule and if he's got a mixture of schedules, then he will generally be in a car. So hope that clears that up. Um, whether he's in a car or whether he's on a bike, it does not matter. Some people prefer him to be on a bike. Some people prefer him to be in a car. But it does not matter. OK. Um, if you show your examiner you are a confident rider and you're a safe rider and you're taking into account everything, then you will pass. Whether he is in a car or whether he's on a bike makes no difference at all. And then there's a big myth that everybody says oh, they can only pass so many people on a day. They can only pass so many people. They've passed three this morning, so they're not going to pass any more this afternoon. Well, that is a utter utter load of rubbish okay so wherever you got that from and it seems to be a general feeling that um you know then it is a load of rubbish so if you're good enough to pass you are good enough to pass Whose car is he using his own or DVSAs? DVSAs don't have cars, Dave. Um, they have the bikes, have bikes, but cars they don't. So I've known over the years examiners using uh, their own cars. And if they're not happy to use their own cars, they will use a higher car. So, yeah. Um, some of the higher cars that I've seen over the years, you think, blimey, no wonder they're charging so much for the test fees. But anyway, there we are. That's what it is. So, yeah, they do a mixture of, um, um, yeah, their own and higher cars. Uh, so that's that. Um, 
and we've not even got on the bike yet, have we? So what's next then? Um, what is next then? I suppose it's then getting on the bike and going, going, doing all that. Um, I've also got another video, which I'll post these videos below. I've also got another video about the first five minutes and the first, uh, the first five minutes and the last five minutes of your test. So I'm going to post that on as well down below in the comments. So I'm going to post these in, down in the comments when I've finished or I'm going to have some tea when I've finished. So if I do, it might be later or it might even be tomorrow. Um, but I'm going to do the first five minutes and the last. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to be going through the test report, the ride and test report, okay, in detail. So this is where you, ladies and gents, can start asking questions. Solo rip, will he start the independent ride at any time? Yes. So, I mean, a test route as the independent ride within that test route. Depends what test route he uses, but it could be with it. Yeah, it could be straight away and it could be later on. There's no, there's no, um, there's no telling unless you know what test route you're getting. Um, yeah, I just forgot to do some more congratulations. Um, since lockdown three, so lockdown three, 29th of March, was it? We start back training. And I um, took a decision to take myself out of the diary teaching and made the decision of um, opening up some uh, instructor training workshops. And we repackaged our instructor training workshops. And I'll pop a link, that, link down below about that as well. Um, so just made it more affordable for some people to get in. So sort of a stepping stone, bronze, silver, gold, um, and platinum. And it has proved to be very, very successful. So this is my first instructor training workshop back um, at the beginning of April. And I've just finished my second workshop, my second instructor training workshop, where three people, Debs, Scott, and David, if you're all watching, yeah, uh, this is for you. Uh, it was absolute pleasure to meet you all. And I'm really excited about the prospect of introducing you, ladies and gents, into the industry of teaching. Um, so um, and we're, we're midway through. So uh, that's exciting stuff. I had a really fantastic week with them. And I am um, and also doing another instructor training workshop at the end of July. Um, we've got two signed up already for that. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm introducing new instructors into the industry um, this year, more so than I've done in, 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 in many years. So really exciting times on that. Anyway, just want to congratulate those Dave, Debs and Scott. Well done. Um, and we will continue back on to the riding test report. Ball bag sounds a very good school. One bite between everyone where I go. They give you wrong information, hoping you'll fail. More bucks for them. Well, that is a bit different to us, mate. Have a look at our Google reviews. You can give Charlie a ring. If you want to have a chat, come and meet us. Um, we, yeah, as I say, we've got three schools, just shy of 40 bikes. There's just, just over 10 of us now teaching. But, you know, there's a head count of about 15 of us now. And, um, you know, we will look after you. There's no doubt about that. Sorry to make you hungry. Just having my dinner. Absolutely starving. Yeah, Dave. No, your mates are, mate. No, your mates are. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I've not uh, I've not had my tea yet, but I am looking forward to it once I have finished. Um, raging tortoise. What will happen if I don't understand examiner on mod two? Should I wave or something? Got my test on Thursday. Excited. And so you should be excited. Um, ride for yourself and all that sort of stuff. But watch this live stream. Any questions, you just get far and away. If you don't understand him, just shake your head. Uh, he'll, he'll explain in his in his um, radio brief. But if you, don't, uh, if you don't understand him, just shake your head. But, you know, if you, for whatever reason, you're unsure, just pull over. Just pull over. But they generally tend to repeat stuff quite well a couple of times. So um, ask him. But he shake your head, they'll repeat it. 
Um, homemade chili con carne. Cool, bloody hell, what's he like? You live the eye life, you do, Dave Smith. You live the eye life, blooming chicky con carne. So are we all excited about getting on the bike then for your 35 minute roughly road ride. And um, going to go through the test report. So module two test report coming up. Get liking this video, please. Get sharing this video and get asking those questions because this is going to be a good one. Ninel, my examiner was very articulate and repeated all commands at least three times. Yes, they do. They do not make it difficult for you. They are trying to help you out. Um, and, you know, they are trained to be like that, to try, you know, to get the best out of you. So we're looking at 24 watchers. What was the record? I think we had 62. 62. Can we get that magic 100? 100 would be nice. But I am very conscious of the fact that it is a lovely evening. And many of our viewers might be out on their bikes or they might be out in their gardens. But I do appreciate everybody's um, watching. Now, module two, on the bike, radio's working, on the bike, examiner's in the car park as well, on a bike or in the car, making sure you can hear him, and then in his own time, and yeah, he'll be asking you to move off out of the car park. Now, test centres can be busy, Um so don't just go zooming off. Remember what I say. I'm going to put the link below. First five minutes, last five minutes of your test are are um, hot hot spots, if you like, hot hot spot time frames where a lot of people come unstuck. First five minutes, last five minutes, a lot of people come unstuck. First five minutes because they're nervous. Last five minutes they switch off and get relaxed. So. Um, I'm happy learning my road craft this year on the 125 next year for the mods one and two. Hopefully happy here learning. Good. Yeah. Listen, that's what this channel is all about. Helping people not only at our schools in the northwest, but also people up and down the country. It's um, it's a valuable um, resource of information for you guys. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's good. It's all good stuff. Yeah, so first five minutes, last five minutes of your test, and people come unstuck. So relax. Um, make sure you're well fueled with water. Make sure you're well hydrated. Make sure you've had a good bit of uh, dinner or breakfast. Um, you want, your brain needs fuel, okay? Your brain needs fuel. Um, hey, ball back. Darren's going to come down to us in Manchester. That's what he's after, Darren. We have had um, Dave today is staying over. He came down over from Stockton on Tees, and Dave's not disappointed. So we can uh, help you out. Uh, he's staying in a nice, um, nice local um, hotel, uh, so we can we can point you in the right direction. <laughs> Yes, Neneel, you would pay for this advice. And we're not we're not sort of doing this for you to um, do all your training or not get. You do need um, trainers. You know, this isn't to replace your training um, at your schools. This isn't to replace it. This is to help you out. And you can combine this with your trainers. And it may, may get you to ask questions. It may get you to explore scenarios and so forth and make you a better rider but this is in no way intended to replace any form of training it's as an aid it's a resource it's all free 
put this with your paid tuition and you will have a better chance of passing and be better chance of becoming a better rider. And, you know, that's what it is all about. It's not to um, make you um, attempt to ride without any training. You do need to combine it with professional tuition from your local bike schools. Fantastic, Darren. That's what we like to hear, and you know we will look after you. So, back to the report then. You're on the bike. Ask you to leave the car park. Remember, you're on test. Remember, the test centres are busy environments. Some of the test centres are a multi well they are multi-purpose it's not some where, where it depends where you are i suppose there's casual ones but they're multi-purpose test center could be cars could be um lorries could be coaches trailers all sorts of training going on so it can be quite a busy little um center so remember leaving the car park just be patient it could be other learners just be patient. All you're looking at exiting is safely. So don't don't muck it up by not being patient, considerate, and whatnot. Leaving the uh, car park, the training test cent, the test center car park. Dave Smith, make sure you visit the little boys' room or little girls' room before you go test so you don't get caught short on test. Good tip. Good tip. There's some unscrupulous schools out there just after your cash, and it becomes very expensive. Yep. Your videos have helped me out a lot, laughing. And great. That's what we like to hear. You, you films. As I commented on a video, RGH's new road check mirrors cancel signal mantra alone has been invaluable to me never forget to cancel my indicator so new road command position check your mirrors cancel your signals that's something i sort of did a video a while back actually um yeah new road command position check your mirrors cancel your signals works every time just like when you're approaching it check your mirrors signal maneuver does it exactly the same Okay, so what are we on? 47 minutes in, and we've got 32 people watching us. 32. 62 is our record. So get sharing this video all about Mod 2. Right, you're on the bike. Ask you to leave the center. Remember, consider it, be patient. Don't interfere with anybody. Don't mess it up on the exit. Um and um, you need to continue with the standard that you used on your module one test. So how you're moving off, the ob observations you're taking before you move off, how you're using your slow speed control, how you're braking, all of these things that you um, developed to pass your module one. Don't forget that carry on that standard now when you go out on the road it's very very important that you carry on with that standard um because he's still looking at the control he's still looking at all of the um the things that you you uh, used really on riding the bike on your module one so um the first um number i would su suppose coming in so on your test report on your riding test report you've got different numbers and it's going a little bit dark so what i'm going to do is just put a light on that's better i can see what i'm doing it's just starting to go a little well not dark but it's just you can just a uh, bit of shade coming now um so your, your riding test report um has different numbers and different headings okay so we're going to go through them and then it's do a bit of an explanation and this is what we talk anybody that comes into us on a module two 
um, training uh, lesson for the first time. So after their module one, uh, we then do module two. So we would go through this sheet with them, okay? We would go through the sheet with them and explain all of the, the headings and all of the, the sort of descriptions about um, what the examiner is looking for. So what the examiner is looking for. Check your mirrors before slowing down and speeding up. Absolutely, yeah. Mirrors before brakes, mirrors before speeding. Yeah. How does the examiner deal with that paper whilst riding? Does he keep faults in his head all thirty-ish minutes? Yes, he does. So he will fill a report like this out when he comes back. Maybe has a minute or two before he comes to meet you. But yeah, it's going through. So he'll 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 go through the route with you. And he'll be picking out, remembering those faults. Yes, he does. They're very good at that. So, uh, module two test is seventy-five pounds. Um, our lessons are one six five for three hours. All of our prices are on our website. We offer different courses for different abilities. So, all of our prices are on our website. And our website, I'm just going to type it in for you now. It's there. So take a look on there and you can have a look at all of our prices. Um, so, yeah, number one, then eyesight. So you need to be able to read a number plate from 20.5 meters. And what you've got here is a tick box for serious. So if you can't read the number plate from 20.5 meters, then you would get a serious fault. And what actually happens is that um, the examiner, so you can't read and play, the examiner will go into the test centre manager, the test centre manager will come out with a tape measure, they'd actually measure 20.5 metres specifically, and then if you still can't read it, then you get your serious fault. Dave Hume, got your mod two in the morning. Any last minute tips? Thanks for everything. My last minute tip, David, would be to stay on this live stream and listen to what I'm about to go through. You can even play it back because you've missed 45 minutes of the important stuff pre getting on the bike and going out. We're now just going through the ride and the faults and stuff like that that the examiners are going to be looking for. So what I would say is um, my last minute tip to you, sir, would be to stay on the live stream. Like the channel, share the channel, and subscribe. Um, so, number one, eyesight. Second, 1B is safety questions. Um, and then most two, use of stand. We still need to maintain that on and off at the beginning. But then most of that then is all for your module one. And then number 11, I suppose, is going to come back into a module two, uh, moving away safely in control. So control position, uh, mirror shoulders before you move away. Um, so just like you did on your module one. And then number 12, control. This is broken down into throttle, clutch, gears, front brake, rear brake, steering, balance, slow control and auxiliary controls. And number 12 is control. So very important you maintain what standard you've achieved to pass your module one and you maintain that on your module two. So if you look at the descriptions for one, I cite at the start of the test, the examiner asks you to read a vehicle registration number. If you require glasses or contact lenses to enable you to read this number, you must wear them whenever you ride. OK, so very important. Don't forget your glasses if you need them. Um, if you did not meet the eyesight standard, then your test would have not gone ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, David. Where are you taking your test anyway, mate? Whereabouts are you? Whereabouts are you in the country? How did you find out about the channel? Did it just come on the playlist? We recommended 36 people watching. So getting a bit more interesting. Um, how would an examiner identify control mistakes such as gearing? They can, they can see it. If you're in the wrong gear, you can see it. 
depending extreme chug 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 slow to get going uh, they can hear it you know examiners can get up quite close to you so don't be fooled they have um they they are trained they are trained to use those senses hear sound sight you know they can see it um safety questions then one b you were asked a number of questions re relating to the safety checks that you should make on your machine before you ride for example fluid levels light and tires the examiner also asks you about the effects of carrying a passenger or a load so very important kirkham currently living in lytham fantastic dave sounds like a nice area so yeah um how did you find out about us mate how did you come across the channel um, use a stand, so you're asked to show the examiner that you can ride, you can safely place the machine on and off the stands. So, well, you're not going to be asked that on Model 2, but he's going to be looking at getting on the bike and stands and getting off the bike at the end. So you come back up off your Module 2, so we're still looking at your stand, so it could still be, be classed in there. And as we said then, uh, the first one really coming out there is control. So throughout the test, you need to show that you can use all of the controls smoothly and at the correct time. This results in less wear and tear on your machine and a safer, smoother ride for any passengers. Not that you're going to be taking any passengers on the road, but yeah, you need to see that you've got nice, smooth control. So that's sort of what is a combination of one and two, taking out the two the, the bits that you're going to be using if you want to. The first one then, number 13, is rear observations just got recommended on your channel after searching for some mod tips on mod one fantastic dave good stuff hope the videos help you um so the first section then um number um 11 sorry number 13 um mod two then uh, rear observations and we've got signaling, changing direction, changing speed. So let's just have a little bit of dis discussion on that. Um, number 13, um, rear observations is, you should use the mirrors fitted to your machine safely and effectively. Where mirrors are not sufficient, for example, covering your blind spots, we all know about blind spots, um, then you must take a rear observation, a lifesaver. So lifesaver, shoulder check, chin to shoulder, so on. Um, you should always check carefully before signaling, changing direction or changing speed. And you should always show that OSM PSL, OSM PSL routine effectively. OSM PSL. Let's start with the mirrors then. So first thing with your mirrors, make sure they're clean, make sure they're adjusted, make sure you're comfortable with If you're riding the bike to the test center, they should be fine. But mirrors then. Make sure you're looking in them effectively. Make sure you're not taking too long. So a split second, you're not staring in them. So where are you going to be checking your mirrors? Always checking your mirrors before. So you're not checking your mirrors after any maneuver or any action. Always before. And that gives you the benefit of being able to act on what you see. So mirrors before signal. So if you're going to chain, uh, turn left or turn right, you're checking your mirrors before the signal. Mirror signal maneuver. If you're going down the road at 40 miles an hour and see a new speed sign for 30, you're going to be slowing down. Before you use your brakes to slow down or before you slow down, check your mirrors. You might not necessarily use your brakes if you can just roll off your throttle if you check your mirrors and there's no vehicles behind that are going to benefit from your brake light. So but if there are vehicles behind, you still want to use your brake or dab your brake to get that light activated. Because 40 down to 30, you can just do it with shutting your throttle. Another good little tip is obviously if you're checking your mirrors and you're using your brakes and the brake light brake lights comes on, that is showing your examiner that you've so how many positions have you got in the road? We teach one, two, and three. Two is the center. You're going around a parked car. You might use three or more. So mirrors as a minimum. Mirrors if you're changing position, cha avoiding the road surface or something. So whenever you're changing your road position, direction, mirrors. That aside, we teach you to check your mirrors about every eight to 10 seconds now don't do that robotic you don't want to do it robotic 
make sure you're doing it naturally. And I tend to teach checking your mirrors, approaching hazards. So if you're going down the road and the lights are on green, I check my mirrors. And I teach my pupils to check their mirrors. So if the lights were to change, you know what's behind and you know the action you're able to take and when you can take it. I get my trainees and I do check your mirrors when you see a road sign, a hazard. So you're then riding defensively. You're thinking that spatial awareness. You're recognizing the information. First thing is then you know what that sign is. Check your mirrors. So mirrors nice and regularly. Um, mirrors before signal, mirrors before braking, mirrors before change in position. And as Nanil has mentioned, make sure your mirrors are tightened too. One of mine kept moving during my test. How irritating is that? How irritating is a mirror moving around when you're on the test? You don't need it. So, yes, what a good tip that is. Great stuff, this. I was starting to think biking was full of nut jobs after my mod one. Listening to you has enlightened me. Well, what can I say? Uh, we've been doing it for 20 years and we know what we're doing. Um, I'm not saying that we uh, know everything. We don't. We're always learning. Um, as a school, we are modern. We are always learning. But with us, you get honest advice. We're not the cheapest. Um, we might be the dearest. Um, but you get what you pay for. You get what you pay for. Um, and you get something quite special with us, I must say. Um, recommend Chrome Northwest window glass cleaner for mirrors than a rain repellent. Yeah, good stuff. Pop a link in the description, Dave, if you have. Um, does the examiner care? I'm in position one or three for back roads to see around Ben better. Yes. I'm going to come on to Ben's a little bit later. Ben's are on number 26. So we've got a bit of a way to go yet, Raging Tortoise. So stay on the channel. And I will get round to Ben's because um, you can change position on Ben's. But no, you, you wouldn't be um, changing the position as you have mentioned there. So stay tuned. Lots to come. So what do I, hey, look at that. We've got 29 people watching at the moment with 29 likes. That ain't bad, is it? 30 people watching with 20 likes. I think we just topped 32. 32 is all right. I'm quite pleased with 32. I am quite pleased with 32. And I haven't even got started yet. And, you know, when we have a module two lesson, this is part of the talk we teach to all of our module two trainees. This is what we teach on a daily basis. So if you're, if a lot of this is something you've never heard before, then what are you paying for? Um, but as I said, the content of this live stream, take it, use it, extract what you want, but use it with your instructors. You know, use it with your instructors. It might help some of you. You might get an instructor that's only just qualified, then got the experience that we've got. You can help them, and it may, may help them. You can help each other. We all want to help each other. We're all in it for the same reason. Um, hi, why isn't there much info in the highway code on spiral roundabouts? What's a spiral roundabout? Or am I being daft? I've never heard of a spiral roundabout. I've heard of the magic roundabout in Swindon. And I actually went over the magic roundabout about 10 days ago. The magic roundabout at Swindon. Um, so that was number 13, rear observations. Hope that helps on mirrors. But of course, you've got the rear observations then on the lifesavers. So your lifesaver is your chin to shoulder. It's your blind spot check. 
And this is something that can can come quite naturally to riders and it can come is a bit alien. But you cannot change a lane without a lifesaver. You cannot move off from the side of the road without a lifesaver. Um, the important thing with lifesavers, like the mirrors, is the timing needs to be before you're committing to whatever manoeuvre you're doing. If you do it whilst you're carrying out the manoeuvre, it's too late. You always want to give yourself time to be able to act on what you see. And any, any, any observation, mirrors or direct, looking over your shoulder, mirrors are indirect, shoulder are direct, any of these rear observations, the timing needs to be that you can act on what you see. So just before. So just before the manoeuvre, give yourself time that you can act on what you see. So moving off from the side of the road, lifesavers. If I'm on the side of the road, I'd look left lifesaver, left shoulder, left mirror, right mirror, right shoulder before I go, if it's safe. Um, changing lanes. Even round park cars, mirrors are not. If you if you think if you've done that diagram of your blind spots, your mirrors are not going to cover that blind spot. So even if I'm going around a park car, mirrors lifesaver. Go past the park car, mirrors left lifesaver. I'm not going in and out and in and out and in and out. If there's loads of park cars, I'll stay out if it's safe. But yeah, uh, lifesavers. Also lifesavers on roundabouts. So lifesavers exit in roundabouts. Um, so if you're going straight on at a roundabout and you're in the left lane, if there's two lanes on approach, straight on at a roundabout in the left lane, you'd favour your right lifesaver on exit before you exit. If you're in the right lane going straight on, you favour the left lifesaver before you exit because they're where your dangerous areas are going to come from. If you're turning right at a roundabout at three o'clock, you're going round, your left indicator after the exit before the one that you want, you're doing a left lifesaver. Very, very important. If you're changing lanes, lifesavers. Can anybody else think of when you do a lifesaver on your tests? Can you help each other out any other time you would want to do a lifesaver on your test? Oh, spiral means traffic controlled roundabouts following the lanes by road markers. Right? Yes. Well, the important thing, Bri, on those is you need to stay in the lane. There's a real tricky one now in Darwin in Blackburn goes under the M65 and you're going round the roundabout in the outside lane. And there's a then you get potentially traffic coming off going onto the motorway. But you, you, you round your lanes. You need to stay in your lane. You can't go drifting over those white lines and things. You can have problems. So lane discipline, and it's all about planning. Plan the roundabout. Lane discipline, um, and you know, be aware. Yeah, be aware because a lot of people don't know what they're doing on roundabouts. <laughs> Yeah, each lane there spoke. Stay on. Stay in your lane. Watch the road markings. Watch, watch the lanes. What's your throttle hand move like? What's your throttle hand move like? Gently. Thickness of a pound coin at a time. Th throttle sense is really, really important. I use a look of the left side of a parked car to give it an idea on side roads if parked cars near junctions. Yes, definitely do a lifesaver when you're doing your hill start, hill start from an angle. Always lifesaver, mirrors, lifesaver. You see anything, Dave? Dave Hume, moving off exercises. If you're doing anything there, uh, make sure you don't interfere with anybody. So moving off, you could get on your test behind a parked car. You could get on a gradient. So and you could get you ask you pull over half a dozen times. Always check your mirrors, check your lifesavers. If you go around that parked car, make sure nothing's coming. Make sure there's nothing coming up behind you faster. Because if you make that vehicle break or slow down, you're going to pick up a serious fault. So take your time. Think about what you're doing. But observations is really, really important. No one seems to indicate until exit, though. Yeah, well, you can't indicate to come off until you're past the exit before the one that you want. Lifesavers at traffic lights. Well, every time you move off from a standstill, you should be mirrors and shoulders every time. 
uh, rage as well. Just a tip to everyone, don't practice roundabouts and junctions just by looking at other drivers. The majority of them are signaling wrong. Correct. Always do your own thing. Always do your own thing. Yeah, so I actually skipped that. That was Dave. Um, that was... Um, David Hume just reminded me on that. Thank you, David, because the moving away exercise number 11, you could get moving off exercises. It's not uncommon for him to pull you over half a dozen times, but he could get you to move off behind a parked car. He could get you to move off um, on a hill up or down, and he could just randomly get you to find somewhere safe, move off. So moving off, observations are so important. Do not make any other vehicle change speed or position. Um, indicate in if you're going to pull over. Yeah, indicate in if you're happier to do that. You don't need to if there's nothing around. So observation, there's nobody's going to benefit from the indicator, don't indicate. But if you're happier to indicate, indicate in. Very, very important to turn that indicator off because people end up then getting a fault when they're moving off with the left indicator on because they left it on. So think about that one. Indicate. Only indicate if it is going to be of benefit to anybody. Right, so let's um, move on. I hope that makes observations a bit clearer. I've got a great video on observations, and I'm going to put that link down below as well. So let me just make a note. So I've got quite a few videos here. I'm going to put on this um, on the comments below. So observation, demonstration video is observation, demo. Um, number 14, signals necessary, correctly, and timed. The description for number 14 is you should have only used the signals shown in the highway code. You should have signaled clearly to let others know what you intend to do, particularly if it would help other road users or pedestrians. You should always signal in good time and ensure the signal has been cancelled after the manoeuvre has been completed. You should not beckon to pedestrians to cross the road. That's an interesting. interesting. It's almost there saying that so a signal is not necessarily putting your indicator on. A signal could be your road position. It could be you gesturing somebody to cross the road. So on your test, if you're what if you're on your road test being assessed, do not nod at people to go. Don't flash at people to go. Don't beckon to people to go because it can open up a can of worms. You might do it on a daily basis, but on your test, do not. So if you've got somebody there at the pedestrian crossing or whatever, don't go doing that on your test for them to go because you could put them at risk and you're going to be having a problem. So um, what did I say I was going to uh, video I was going to do? Um, observation demo. Um signals what i'm going to put on there as well um i'll come on to it in a minute but it's um cancelling signal the video i've got on a routine that i use which is new road command position check mirrors cancel your signal because um a pop common common problem on tests people leave the indicators on and if you leave your indicator on can pick up a serious fault. Okay, so staying on signals, um, indicators, signals. Uh, is it necessary? So find somewhere safe, pull over. Is it necessary to signal? Is it necessary? I'm going around that bus. Is it necessary to signal? You need your signal to be clear, to let the people clearly know what you're doing. Um, and so I'd say pull over on the side of the road. Is it necessary? Well, yeah, if there's a vehicle behind you, yes, absolutely, you need to indicate. But if there's nobody around you, is there any point? If you're happier to indicate, indicate, just make sure you turn it off. Um, is it necessary to indicate around a bus if it's parked up? Well, if you think somebody's going to benefit from that indicator, but bear in mind, you don't want to confuse people, there could be junctions and things. Don't confuse people. Remember, your aside from putting your indicator on, your most powerful indicator is your positioning. So if I if I was coming up to a bus parked up and I had to go around it, I'd get me position three, and that's sort of my signal. And as I'm getting closer, I'm sort of almost then committing. It's safe. I'm committing. 
do a final lifesaver, and that is my sort of signal. Um, whereas an indicator could confuse people. Um, so think about signals necessary. Signals correctly, yeah, it's got to be correctly put on. Um, and um, signals timed. So the timing, you don't want to put your signal on too early, but you want to put it on early enough that it's going to benefit people. You don't want to confuse people and mislead people. So signals um, are, are important. And as I said, I will put a video down below about a routine I use for cancelling the signal because your signal um, doesn't cancel itself. You need to cancel it. And I have a routine that I've sort of used, developed myself, and I've got a great video on it. And it will help you make sure your indicator is turning off. Um, Dave, you, I got told by my instructor, if I have to overtake a bus or a parked car, only put on the signal if I need to go over the white line to do so. No, not, no, that's, well, that's maybe what your instructor teaches you. We don't teach that um, just because a lot of people say to me, because I'm going over the white line, I've got to indicate no, not at all. So I'm quite comfortable if a bus is parked up and I have to go any, any obstruction, I have to go on the other side of the road. Um, if I'm uh, planning it, and I'm in position observations. If I think an indicator would benefit somebody, then yes, but otherwise, no. Um, the bus driver can see me in his mirror. I'm in position three, um, junction opposite. Indicator could fuse people at that junction. So that is not necessarily correct. But you can raise that question. You can raise it if that's what your instructors taught you to do. Don't let me tell you any different, but that is what we teach. If you store your bike on your Mod 2 test, would that count as a minor or major? Any minor fault could escalate into a serious or dangerous. So if you store your bike on your test and you deal with it in a safe manner and there's no other road users um, affected, you may pick up a minor fault. The same scenario and there's traffic behind you and you're now holding that traffic up, you could pick up a serious fault. It really just depends on where it happens, how it happens and how you deal with it and what effect it is having on other road users. I suppose that's how we look at it. Um, so I hope that clears that up remember though your signal could be a brake light your signal can be your observation your lifesaver your signal can be your picture positioning your signal isn't necessarily your indicator solo rip what about pulling off from the side of the road yep just listen back on the playlist later because we've talked about moving off from the side of the road um already that is number Eleven, and we're now on number fifteen. Clearance to obstructions. So, what's the description then of number fifteen? Clearance to obstructions. You need to give parked vehicles and other obstructions safe clearance when passing. Watch out for changing situations such as pedestrians walking out from between parked cars, doors opening and vehicles trying to move off. Be prepared to slow down or stop if needed. So number 15. Yeah, so we always try and leave a metre. So parked cars, we leave a meter, and that's a door opening width. Any obstruction, we try and keep a meter. For cyclists, as example, meter. That tends to work out right and safe. Um, clearance to obstructions, observations. So two to three, mirrors lifesavers mirrors lifesavers coming back in but don't interfere with anybody don't make anybody change speed or direction but also anticipate anticipate um 
Number 16 is a juicy one. Call this one a juicy one because there's quite a lot on it. And this is the one when people say to me and people say people come to me and they say, um, can you do me a test? Can you get me a test? I say, yes. Can you get me a test? And many years ago, I learned this lesson. Can you get me a test in Macclesfield? Yes. Why do you want a test in Macclesfield? I said. Well, I was born and bred in Macclesfield. I know all the roads. Born and bred there, so I know it. I'm happier because we, at the time, were using Northwich. The old test, this is, is going back 18 years ago. So, yeah, not a problem. If you want to test in Macclesfield, we'll go to Macclesfield. Anyway, took the young man to Macclesfield and he failed his test. Because he was too complacent. He was too relaxed. He knows the roads. He was too relaxed. And we get a far better pass rate for um, trainees that don't know the area. And that leads on to number 16. Response to signs and signals. Because if you're riding down the road and you're looking for information, if you're looking for information, you're more, you're looking, you'll focus better if you're not from that area because you're looking. And that's a fact. If you talk to any examiner, the standard of the passes on the module two are better if the candidate does not know the area. So if you're going for your mod two and you're worried that you've not been to that area, don't worry. Does that make sense? So responding to signs and signals. If you see traffic signs, if you see road markings, if you see traffic lights, if you see all this information, then you can deal with it safely. <coughs> you can you can deal with it. If you you when you're going for your module two, you've passed the theory test. It may be that you've been driving on the roads for 30 years. You have some experience, maybe a lot of experience. So if you're if you're looking for the signs and reading the signs, you know how to act to the signs. Now, of course, the worry is if you don't see the sign. As my young man did, did not see it in Macclesfield all those years ago because he switched off. He goes down these roads every day of his week. So we don't even think about him. And he switched off and he failed. And that lesson stayed with me until this day. So the reassurance I say to my trainees, we use eight different test centers and we have a good relationship and we have a good pass rate in all of those test centers. Well, most of them are an hour away. Our lessons are three hours. I cannot spend time taking people around a test route and I don't need to. Over the years we have and we filmed if we yeah, if we filmed them. You can see them on our YouTube channel. So, yeah, if you want to have a look at uh, a test center, test routes, they're on, they're on our YouTube channel. But we don't train people on test routes or test areas. So the response to signs and signals, number 16, is a really, really important one for me. And if you don't see them, you don't know how to act to them. If you do see them, you know how to act to them. And that is really, really important. So make sure that you're comfortable then with your pedestrian crossings. Make sure you're comfortable with the yellow box junctions. Make sure you're comfortable with road craft. Because if you're not comfortable, you can get caught out. Many times you hear of somebody sitting, waiting at a pelican crossing. And as we know, a pelican crossing in its sequence, the the flashing amber light comes on and pedest the pedestrians. And I've had people on, on a test that they're sat waiting and the flashing amber's on and they're sat waiting and there's no pedestrians on the crossing. So the examiner tells the, the candidate to, you know, to get going. And that's that's then a fail. 
Um, so make sure you're comfortable with those sort of things, the green arrows, the traffic light filter arrows. Make sure that you're comfortable with bus lanes and stuff like that. You know, people, so many people comment, I don't want to go in bus lanes, I don't go in them. But you do, you do need to use bus lanes if the times permit. So if the times permit, use the bus lane. Because if you get undertaken, you will get a serious fault. So use the bus lane. Make sure you're comfortable with road craft. If you're in doubt, check with your instructor. You know, people don't stop at a solid white line at a stop junction and wonder why they, they pick up a serious fault. Stop, foot down. Green, green traffic light. Yes, it is go. But it is only go if it is safe to go. So make sure your exit's clear. It's common sense, but think about it and don't rush it on signs looking for information all the time. You're in a 30 miles an hour road and you see a new sign for a 50. You cannot do anything until you get to the 50. So when you get to the 50, check your mirrors, look over your right shoulder, increase your speed to 50 if it's safe so that your examiner can see that. You're doing your right lifesaver because people do go a bit too early, don't they? And indeed, I've had people go too early on their tests, but you won't get away with it. Yeah, you're going down the road at 50 and you see a new sign for 30. Well, you need to be at 30 when you get to that 30 sign, not get get 50, keep it going. And then when you get to the 30, slow down, that's too late. Get your 30 down before you get there. So check your mirrors, use your brake light, let the examiner see that you've You've, um, you know, that you've you've seen it in your acting. So um, response to signs and signals is is a big, juicy one. It's one that you need to be aware of. And don't worry if you're going for your test in an area that you don't know, because. From my experience and the examiners that tell me time and time again the the um, trainees that pass are at areas they're not familiar with it's a better standard of rider because they are focused so be one of those be one of those that are focused so that is an important one response to signs and signals okay happy with that any questions on that we're currently on 34 people watching wow that's good and we got 31 likes so yeah Please do, everybody, like and share the video. This is all good stuff. It's open and honest information for you up and down the country watching. They, uh, module two, any questions, you just get asking away. Any questions, get asking away. But I'm going through the official riding test report for your module two. Look at that, 33 people watching, 33 likes. That's happy with that. When am I going to get to 100? I want to give away a free CBT. I want to give away a free CBT. You can transfer it to somebody else. 100 people watching this live stream at the same time. 100 people, I will give away a free CBT. Either you can use it in our Wigan site, you can use it on Northwich site or our Manchester site. So let's get 100 people watching. I will give away a free CBT. Um, number 17 is use of speed. So what's the description? I've got two people, me personally. What... Two people, me personally, module twos tomorrow, they should be watching. Why aren't they watching? I've got um who have I got on mod two tomorrow? I've got a lady, Sue, and a chap, I think his name's Lee. So they should be should be watching this, picking my brains. Yeah, laughing dog, if you're the wrong, if you're in the wrong lane. Don't try and correct it. 
Um, I would always say, if you're in the wrong lane, just go the wrong way. On your test, if you're in the wrong lane, go the wrong way. Let the examiner deal with it because then you're doing it safe. If you're in the wrong lane, you try and correct it and then you you know miss a lifesaver or make somebody change speed or direction, you're going to pick up the serious fault. So if you're in the wrong lane, go the wrong way. You can't fail you for going the wrong way as long as it's safe. If you're coming up to traffic lights with a queue of traffic and there is a junction on your left with no keep clear or yellow box, should you keep it clear for traffic turning? Yes, you should. Yeah. That's my only minor. Wrong lane at a roundabout, but no other driver drivers around. Get away. Yeah. Any any fault can be a minor fault. It can escalate into a serious or a dangerous. Just depending on, yeah, the 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 sort of the circumstances around it. And there's never ever two circumstances the same. What's my advice for steamed up visors? Lift it up, have, a, have an inch gap. Um, buy a helmet with a pin lock. Next time you get a helmet, buy one with a pin lock. But a steamed up visor, lift it up slightly, let some air circulate in it. Right, let's have a look then. Where were we then? So we've moved on to use of speed. Number 17. You should may you should have made a safe and reasonable progress, keeping in mind the road traffic and weather conditions, road signs and speed limits. You need to show confidence based on sound judgment, remembering at all times that you must be able to stop within the distance you can see the road to be clear. That's an important one, isn't it? Um, there's a lot of emphasis. There's a lot of emphasis with getting up to speed on test. And a lot of people don't, you know, if you're out on your own, don't want to get up to speed. But on your test, you need to show the examiner that you're able to get up to speed, that you are confident, you're taking into account all the conditions, weather conditions and stuff like that. And I suppose the underlying at the end there, it said, but all that aside, so you need to know what the speed limit is in order to think about getting up to speed. And it's the highways department have made those speed limits. So if they say it's a 30, you should be able to get up to 30. 60 should be able to get into up to 60. However, it is really important to take into account the weather, road conditions, and always, don't matter where you are, what the situation is, always be able to stop in the distance you can see to be clear. And if you can't, then, you know, the examiner can see that. And, you know, you are ultimately going to be putting yourself at risk, aren't you? So, yeah. Um, Yes, we were 2019. We were in Wigan on the Honda dealership. Um, now we are on the Three Sisters Race Circuit. Um, and the Three Sisters Race Circuit, we have our open day on this Saturday. This Saturday, we have our open day on the Three Sisters Race Circuit in Wigan. So does anybody want to come and say hello? RJH Motorbike Training are back in Wigan. We are returning. We are returning to Wigan onto the Three Sisters race circuit. So come and say hello. Yeah, so it's important to get up to speeds. Um, and, uh, you know, given the road and traffic conditions. Let's have a look then at number 18, following distances. So what's a good following distance? So the basics, two-second rule, four-second rule. Only a four breaks a two-second rule. And if it's raining, double it. Yeah, he should. Yeah, well, if he's not telling you this, ask him why. Uh, we want people to pass. We not only want people to pass, we want pe people to be a nice rider. Um, so, you know, there we are. Darren, two seconds dry, wet to 10, 10 in the snow and ice. Yes. So they do look at the following distance very carefully. And what I say is if you're getting up behind vehicles at traffic lights or junctions and stuff like that, a couple of bike lengths or a couple of car lengths, enough room you can get around it. Um, 
And, you know, if you're on a hill and it's a heavier goods vehicle in front, a little bit more, you don't want that rolling back at you. So following distances are important. Now, what's the description? You should have kept a safe distance between you and the vehicle in front. You should have been able to stop safely well within the distance you can see to be able to be clear and leave extra distance in wet or slippery conditions. Leave sufficient space when stopped in traffic queues. Yeah, so a couple of car lengths at traffic queues, whether wherever that is, enough that you can get around them. <laughs> Come and see us, k &S, in Wigan on Saturday. There's a few of us there. I'm there on Saturday. And there's cake, I believe. There is cake. Yeah, stay. Uh, yeah, well, Darren, yeah, you're not wrong, Darren, but I always say your two-second rule should be sufficient. The more distance, if you're going further back and further back, car behind and get in the space. If you're buying an HGV, change your position so you can see them in their mirror. If you can see them in their mirror, they can see you. So two seconds generally is still what we recommend. Progress, appropriate speed, undue hesitation. Number 18, progress. Getting through them now, folks. Um, progress. You need to show that you can ride at a realistic speed appropriate to the road and traffic conditions. You should approach all hazards at a safe, controlled speed without being too cautious or affecting other road users. You should always be able to ready to move away at junctions as soon as it's safe to correct to do so. Riding too slowly can create dangers for yourself and others. Yeah, so um, progress. Ride for yourself. A lot of um, trainees um, get caught out there um, because they, they're at a junction or wherever they are, and they're waiting, for the, they're waiting for a gap so they can go with the examiner, and that's not what they want to see. Um, they um, 100 CBTs. Wow, what's that? 100 CBTs. Always say far enough back. I'm quite far away from you guys, Suffolk Coast, but I think I'll visit her in the area to say, Hey, yeah, more than welcome, raging tortoise, to come and see us. What's 100 CBTs? Wow, what's that then? Um, so. Where were we then? I got waylaid. Progress. A lot of a lot of trainees when they go for tests, they're waiting and waiting. Uh, nine o'clock, K and S will be there. Nine twelve, you'll catch somebody. Um, three sisters, Wigan. Oh, one hundred viewers at the same time, and then I give you a free CBT. Yeah, 100 viewers. That's what I'm after. So if you want a free CBT, I'm looking to get 100 viewers. So, yeah, making progress. So somebody goes for tests and they just they just turn into this new rider and they they got this guy behind on a bike that looks like a policeman. And every time they come into a roundabout or a junction, they're waiting, waiting for that opportunity so they can go with him. They don't want to see that. You need to get going. And I always say to my trainees, try and lose him. Try and get going. So every time you hear, um, okay, Rob, find somewhere safe, pull over. Oh, okay. Off you go. And when it's safe, yeah. Two minutes later. Okay, Rob, find somewhere safe, pull over. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, and then off you go again. Two minutes later. Okay, then, Rob, find somewhere safe, pull over. That means one thing. And that means, as you're saying, Laughing Dog, Riding for yourself. Ride for yourself. Get going. Ride for yourself. Don't wait for him. But don't make. So if you do get going, remember, you need to be doing it at a speed that you can react to stuff. Give yourself time. Give yourself time to be able to react. Um, but get yourself going. That is number 18. Uh, junctions 20 junctions approaching speed observation turn right turn left cut and corners yeah junctions osm psl position one two three you know if you go a major to minor left turn and you're in position three you're gonna have a problem if you're turning right major to minor position two you're gonna have a problem you need a good reason not to be in those positions and sometimes you can't go in them positions because of obstructions but you know turning left position one turning right position three OSM, PSL, don't make anybody change speed or direction. 
Stop if it's a stop. Give way if you can look right, left and right. Any road you're emerging onto, your observation minimum wants to be right, left and right. When you go over that white line, you want to be looking where you're going. Always get in your OSM, PSL. And as I said before, once you've completed your manoeuvre, new road, command position, check your mirrors, cancel your signal, I will be putting that video link down below. So number 20, description at drums. Your examiner looks to see that you have dealt safely with road junctions. Use the OSM PSL in that order. Observation, signal, manoeuvre, position, speed, look. Don't mix and mash it. Don't check your mirrors after your signal. You're going to be on you like a rash. Yeah, a guy I know failed because he was in position three to turn left. He's probably a wagon driver. We get HGV drivers, bus drivers come to the bike test and getting them over to position one on a left turn. You're having to, oh, blimey, because they're normally in position three and they're in the wagon or towing a trailer or something like that. Positions one, two, three, really, really important. Laughing dog, yes, he was. Guarantee it, I see it every day, every day. What do you fail on? Position three, turn left. Right, what do you do for a living? I'm a bus driver. Yep, so, you know, we know what we're doing and we know what the examiners are looking for. Um, Where were we? Junctions. Your examiner looks to see that you dealt safely with road junctions. The use of OSM PSL procedure, positioning approach, speed and observation is essential to negotiating junctions and roundabout safely. Turning right across busy roads, dual carriageways is particularly dangerous. You need to be confident that you can judge the speed and distance of oncoming traffic safely. You need to look out for other road users emerging and turning at junctions and be ready to move or stop. You need to be extra watchful in poor light or bad weather conditions and for more vulnerable road users, such as cyclists and other motorcyclists. So if you turn a left position three, you're allowing a moped, a motorcyclist, or even a cyclist to come inside. You're not closing that door. Um, put a pack of chalky hobnobs in position one, Rob. They'll be over there. They will, but Graham will be there first. He's quiet tonight, Graham. He's not on tonight, is he? Um, Raging Tortoise. If you fail to completely stop at a stop sign, is that a fault or a failure? Yeah, you need to stop and put your foot down. Every time Rage and Tortoise stop with your front wheel behind the white line, just behind it, put that left foot down. So come to a stop, boom, then look right, left and right, and then go. And also, if you've got a vehicle in front of you that stops and you're the vehicle behind, and then he goes, don't just go, you come up and stop, boom. And then when you go, if you look in your mirror, then your examiner will have stopped foot down. Uh, so, yeah, stop foot down. If you don't, you'll fail. I got into biking for a weekend fun. So far, it's been anything but fun. I choose the wrong people. Big mistake. Listen, get on, get on that, get on, watch some of our reviews. Get get yourself down to Manchester. You'll we'll sort you out, mate. Honestly, we hear it all the time. You know, there's some good schools out there. You know, there are some good schools out there. I'm not saying they're not. We we you know we have good relationships with most of our our competitors. Um, you know, we you know there are some good guys. Right. To your skill level not other bikers absolutely ride for yourself and you get that when you pass your test and we always recommend getting out don't go trying to keep up with your mates you do your own thing get over to rjh manchester for your mod one or two ball bag mate money well spent thank you darren nearly time for my beauty sleep got a 5 a.m start tomorrow so will be going in 50 minutes yeah i'm probably wrapping up a bite in a couple of hours anyway uh dave but nice of you to join us okay now, the bikes you use are they heavy that's what i'm afraid of dropping them as i'm nine stone wet through though <laughs> uh okay now, just say hey, listen we got a variety of bikes we're actually getting a rebel little one uh so come and have a look I'm balls deep with this bunch. It's like that once you put your money down. I know. Yeah, I know. Laughing dog, is that for the thick white lines you need to stop, even if it's here? Absolutely. Solid white line in front of your left to right. Stop 
foot down. Even if it's clear, stop foot down. Never ride faster than your guardian angel can fly. Good tip, Dave. Um, so junctions, yeah, including roundabouts. So we talked about roundabouts, um, observations going straight on at a roundabout. If you've got two lanes, left lane straight on, right lifesaver, uh, right lane straight on, left lifesaver. Um, if you're going straight on, single lane lifesaver, maybe left one if you're going to do one, but it's probably unnecessary. You can see everything on there. Never say never. Never say never and never say always. Um, important one on the roundabout is if you're turning right. So after 12 o'clock, you're turning right, you're in the right lane or to the right of the single lane, right indicator on all the way around left indicator after the exit before the one you want and a left lifesaver now instant fail on you if you don't do that fail on your test yeah i've got a fantastic video i'm going to put the link below about roundabouts so um roundabouts i'm going to put all these links to the direct videos of them okay let's think about judgment then number 21 uh, judgment when you're overtaking and filtering. Oh, judgment when you're meeting and judging when judgment when you're crossing. Um, judgment, your examiner assess your judgment skills throughout the test. You need to show sound judgment when overtaking, filtering, meeting, or crossing the path of other road users. You should only do so safe, legal, making your intent clear, and being sure you understand the interference of other road users. Yeah, you don't want to interfere with other road users. So, a couple of scenarios then. Uh, don't make anybody change speed or direction because of your actions. Um, filtering, we, gen we generally don't be doing any of that on a test. Um, evening again, DR. Good evening. Yeah, you've missed quite a lot, mate. This is all about module two, but you can play it back. Any questions? Yeah, but it's all about module two. We're getting through the test sheet now. Going to be about another 15 minutes and we're done. Um, but judgment, so filtering, generally not a no-go. In, in 18 years of teaching, presenting people for tests, I've had somebody um, encouraged to filter on two occasions, um, but no. Just give you a look, like and a sub. Thank you very much, K and S. That is what we want. Um, and, yeah, I'm just going to go through that laughing dog now. It's quite a, quite an interesting one, feedback we get from examining things. But um, So don't make anybody change speed or direction um, in, 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 in anything like that. So filtering generally not, as I said, twice in, in, in 18 years. Um, judgment when you are um, overtaken. So overtaken, really, on your test, Yes, if you get an opportunity to overtake and it is safe, it's legal, and it's going to be beneficial to you, then do it. Now, you might be down country lanes and things and the national speed limits and everything. You get a slow-moving vehicle. You know, if it's safe, get going, get an overtake. But you need to make sure that you're doing it safely. So observations and everything else. You need to make sure it's going to be benefit to you. If you get that opportunity and it's, yeah, then do it. Um, dual carriageways and things, then, yeah, if you get an opportunity to overtake and get up to speed, and then great, do it. Um, don't want to be breaking the speed limits on any overtaking. And, of course, if you're in maybe, say, a dual carriageway and you're at 70 mile an hour and you're staying in that left lane at 45 and you could be overtaken, that's not going to go down well. OK, that's not going to go down well. Um, no, you would not, laughing dog. So if you're in a queue of traffic and uh, you've got an examiner following the car, you ain't going to keep up with you anyway. So don't do not do any filtering on your test um, unless your examiner tells you to do so. All right. But no, just sit in the traffic. Be patient. Two lanes of traffic is different. If you get two lanes of traffic, you can make progress in that right hand lane. Get going. Um, you know, if you're coming up to a set of traffic lights and there's a dozen vehicles in the left lane, nothing in the right, get in that right hand lane. Make that progress. Now, what about crossing traffic? We'll talk about crossing traffic and meeting traffic. Crossing traffic, don't make anybody change speed or direction. Um, we have a test route in, in Atherton, really busy major, major to minor right turn. Vehicle comes towards you, could flash you to go. So if you if somebody flashes you to go and you can see that it's intended for you and it's perfectly safe and legal to do so, safe, 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 
uh, take that advantage and go. All right. The examiner could be on a car in a test. Yes. And the reason why KNS is back towards the video. So play back this video and you'll listen to all that because, yeah, there is uh, people say to me, oh, examiner's in the car because it's raining. Mm -mm, mm -mm, doesn't work like that. There is a very genuine reason why an examiner could be in a car following you. Um, meeting traffic. So got, got parked cars on your side of the road. Um, the obstruction is on your side of the road. You need to hold back for oncoming traffic. Or if it's a wide road, you can get through and you're not going to interfere with anybody, then do so. Um, obstruction on the other side of the road, nothing on your side. You have the priority on traffic coming towards you. But when you're on a bike, yeah, the chances are they're going to be coming through towards you over the white line. So play around with your position and you've got one, two, three positions. So come into position one to make it safer. All right. Um, so be flexible with that road position. Now, park cars, both sides, traffic, big wide road, both you and the traffic, you're able to get through. But what you don't want to be doing is getting closer to the moving traffic to the stationary traffic and don't think you're going to hold that position if you've got vehicles coming towards you because there's only going to be one winner cars are a lot heavier than you so you need to be flexible important thing is do not make anybody change speed or direction and don't get closer to that moving traffic than the stationary traffic so play around with your positioning just be aware of the effect of it on others um Bike tests were so simple when my dad did his once once round the block. Yeah, that's where I did that at a T, T junction. I got flashed at by a van, so proceeded by the next lane, didn't stop, so I had to wait for it to be clear in the road. Yeah, I did that at a T junction. I got flashed by a van, so proceeded by the next lane, didn't stop, so I had to wait for it to be clear in the road. Yeah, um, bike tests were simple back then. Yeah, round the block but roads were not as busy as they are now. Roads now are a lot busier, um, and the test is a lot, bikes are a lot faster, bikes are a lot lighter. So it needs to be, it needs to be right now. Roads are a busy, busy place. The roads are a busy, busy place. Um, next one, positioning then, normal riding lane discipline. Positioning is number 22. We're nearly there, folks. Position in is, is number 22. And you should position your machine in a safe position as a general rule in the center of your lane. Be flexible. You should have kept clear of parked vehicles and position yourself correctly for the direction that you intend to take. Where lanes are marked, you should have kept the middle of the lane and avoided straddling lane markings. You should not change lanes when not needed. Be aware of where you are at all times as other road users judge what you may be may do based on this yeah so lane discipline always favoring the left lane nothing wrong with using the right lane to make your progress but back in the left lane don't sit in the right lane unnecessarily holding traffic back and encourage them to undertake you uh, lane discipline at roundabouts um now normal riding position two but you have three positions one two and three so use them according to what you see um what about position around uh, over pol sleeping policemen if you've got a sleeping policeman all the way across the road that's fine but those cubes so go left to the cube cube go to the right of the cube um there one and two the last option really is go over the cube if you're going over the cube you need to get your speed down but favor whichever one is best i always favor the right of the cube i can see further down the road but if i've got traffic coming towards me i might consider the left one it just depends there's no right and there's no wrong um jalal amico during the test can i use own camera thanks from bristol um you you can't just rock up with a camera and film it no but you can get permission so you can get permission to film it so yeah get in touch with the test center uh and 
um, get permission and it, it, yeah, it can be allowed. So, but you can't just do it. Younger people are more, but nice of you to join us, Jalal. I know I've commented, seen you a lot of times on comments and everything. Nice of you to join the live stream. And I, my neck of the woods is just north of Bristol. In the about 40 minutes north of Bristol is where I am from. Andresia, but younger people are more adaptive to busy roads and older ones who make the rules and not the air. Well, younger people can be, but the older people have got the experience. So there's, yeah, many different ways that you can look at it. You go to the edges of the, yeah, good. Raging torches. Got to run. Many thanks for this informative session and good luck, everyone, for your upcoming test. Yes, thanks for joining us, Raging Tortoise. Um, so road position, I think that was normal ride be flexible. Lane discipline, that's good. Now, pedestrian crossings. Um, again, I've got a video. I've got one video on how to approach a pedestrian crossing. I think it was a, a toucan, I think. But I'll dig that out and put it on but all pedestrian crossings approach them with a view that could be pedestrian so good scan around if you're approaching a pedestrian crossing now you've got a pelican or let's start with the uncontrolled pedestrian crossing is a zebra so you've got a zebra and then the controlled ones you've got a pelican a puffin a toucan and a pegasus i think that's right pelican toucan Puffin Pegasus. And I believe there's a new one being just out in Stockport, I think. A sparrow, I think it's called. I'm not not I need to do a bit of homework. But make sure you're comfortable with all those pedestrian crossings. What does a flashing amber light at the Pelican mean? You know, don't sit there waiting. If it's not, if it's clear, go. Um, you know, so make sure who can use a toucan? Cyclists. So on approach to any pedestrian crossing, check your mirrors, have a good scan around, be prepared to slow down and stop. But don't want to be slowing down on approach. You need to be confident. You know, if you've got somebody waiting, at, um, don't don't beckon them. Make them make their own decision. If you've got somebody waiting at a zebra crossing, come to a stop. But don't be beckoning them. Let them make the decision. But approach and pedestrian cross is really important. Um, and people, you know, you can see them. They're, the signs are there. You can see them. So approach them correctly. Normal stops. So where would you not stop? There'll be other lines. Why not? I have a great video making it very clear about stopping on double yellow lines. So if your examiner, and I'll do the I'll do the link below, but if your examiner asks you to pull over, and as we've established, he could ask you to pull over half a dozen times, it's not a problem. You need to find somewhere safe. Don't park up outside someone's driveway with a drop curb. Don't stop within 10 meters of a junction. Don't stop in a bus stop. Don't stop on double yellow lines. Don't stop on a brow of a hill. Don't stop up on a, uh, a bend. I mean, parking this is. So if he asks you to pull over, avoid all those areas. Um, you need to find somewhere safe, legal, convenient to pull over. Now, double yellow lines. Yeah. So he's he's OK with you stopping on double yellow lines if um, he's stuck at lights. So maybe you, you've gone through your lights, they're on green, you've gone through, and then the lights change and he has to stop. Double yellow lines are acceptable. But, you know, if you're traveling down, the lights are on green, you always want to anticipate they're going to change. So checking your mirrors. You don't want to slow down, but just be prepared. You need to stop. If, but the thing is, don't go through an amber or red light. So always be prepared to slow down and stop on a green light. But double yellows are acceptable if he's stuck you know it um it traffic lights and can't keep up with you so if he loses that flow with you double yellow lines are acceptable link below of that video really really important um number 25 is awareness and planning so the further you look the earlier you plan the easier it is and his instructions are going to come easy so um you know, that's important, awareness and planning. Don't leave things to the last minute. Now, the last section, 26, well, not the last, we've got 26, and I've got um, another area. I haven't got a number, though. The last section, 26, is bends. Somebody asked about bends, one, two, three. Now, on a bend, on a test, 
um, country lane bends, things like that. You can change position. The DVSA are happy for you to change position on a right hand bend. So if you're approaching a right hand bend, check your mirrors, you can come into position one. And the benefit of position one is that you're going to be able to see further through the bend. Your vision limit point has improved. It means if you're leaning over, you're nowhere near that center white line. So position one on a right hand bend is acceptable. This is out of town in the rural areas. Right, I'm not in town. In town, you want to stay in those command positions. But out of town, in the country lanes, position one on a right hand bend is acceptable and advisable for the benefits of what I've just said. Any any speed change or gear change before the bend, they don't like brake lights on a bend. It's not we don't teach people to brake on a bend. So that forward planning, get your speed, get your gear down before the bends. So position one on right hand is acceptable. Now, where people get confused is they think, oh, I can go on to position three on left hand bend. Now, if you're doing further training, your ERS, Enhanced Rider Scheme or Advanced Training, after the practical test, yes, position three on a left hand bend is acceptable. But for your module two tests, it is not acceptable. They don't want you going over to position three on a left hand bend. They feel, the DVSA feel you're not experienced enough to deal with somebody coming towards you cutting that white line. So on your test, ladies and gents, on your module one test, sorry, on your module two test, position two on a left hand bend. Do not go to position three, unless you've got an obstruction, of which case you have to get speed all the way down and stuff like that. Never say never. But as a rule, position two on a left hand bend, position one on a right hand bend no gears no brakes hope that clears that up um eco safe riding think of the environment think of a smooth ride think of a progressive ride not fast and slow fast and slow fast and slow forward plan a smooth ride always try and travel in the highest possible gear giving you speed think of your pocket think of your environment he can see that he can think about it he can use his senses but eco safe riding so two hours and two minutes wow have we all had a good evening um i think i've covered quite a lot there cheers ball back i think i've covered most things i will get those links down below if there's anything that hasn't come out let me know <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but that is what we do. That is all about your module two. Get them questions in there for me. Um, and good luck to all of you that have got tests coming up. Keep me posted. Keep messaging me. It really does make it all worthwhile. But um, I, th I suppose... The biggest piece of tip that I can give anybody going for their module two is enjoy it. And think of the incentive once you have passed. And when you pass, you can pat yourself on the back because it is an achievement. And it is an achievement that a lot of people want to do, but they just don't because they can't for whatever reason. Now, you are all some of the lucky ones. And um, as I've said before, it doesn't get much better than out on a motorbike. It is an absolutely fantastic um, hobby, whatever you want to call it. But a lot of people are very envious of you, ladies and gents, for doing what you're doing. So when you pass that module two, pat yourself on the back. It is an achievement. And um, when you do it, welcome to the club. 
So I'm going to say good night. Uh, good luck to all of you with up and coming tests. Keep me posted, posted as to how you get on. But until next time, ciao for now. Bye now.